Uh, next up, Steve Mann. Uh, he's one of the top 15 B2B CMOs to watch, been voted. And uh, he was recently the CMO of LexisNexis. And he's in a very interesting space, his company Able Brains. Uh, and what he's going to talk about is the intersection between neuroscience and marketing. Um, so, may I welcome Stephen Mann. Steve Mann. Thank you. How y'all doing? Good. All right. So, you know, right now my uh, amygdala is, you know, letting loose with lots of glutamate, right? And glutamate is this chemical that says, you know, talks to the hypothalamus and it says, you know, I'm going to raise your heart rate and I'm going to raise your respiration rate and I'm going to make you sweat. And in other words, I'm excited. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So I just kicked in my parasympathetic nervous system right now, which lowers my heart rate and lowers my respiration. So it enables me to be able to talk to you about, you know, what it is to wire your consumer's brain or how I like to think about it, how to impress your mom and your boss by being a great digital marketer and occasional neuroscientist. So who am I? So I really dig mashing up digital marketing with eclectic disciplines like neuroscience. My passion is helping digital marketers build and scale their marketing function, as well as helping C-levels like drive digital transformations of their enterprise. I am the father of triplets. You can't really see them here right now, right? But they're sitting there in the middle, um, plus three more. So I consider myself pretty expert in managing chaos, and that's what we'll talk a little bit about today. So clap your hands if you believe that your conscious mind rules your behavior. Wow, I am so impressed. Clap your hands if you believe your non-conscious mind rules your behavior. All right. So that's interesting that you say that because as marketers, we tend to focus on the rational in individuals. We tend to try to craft rational arguments to, um, to attract somebody to our brand. The problem with that is, is that um, we never ever speak to the non-conscious in individuals. And that's a major problem. We go about trying to uncover, well, what arguments should I make to this individual? And we use tools like predictive, uh, predictive analytics. Uh, we use tools like segmentation, uh, persona development to uh, understand what's driving our buyers. But we never really truly ask ourselves the right questions. Do we, we never truly ask the question, what motivates a buyer to buy at its deepest financial fundamental level. What unconscious notions drive them to want to um, make a purchase? And if we do ask those questions, we typically end up rolling back towards the rational. Right? We start thinking about things like in B2B situations, you know, what are your needs, what are your pains, what are your concerns, and then let me try to craft a marketing campaign to address those. Now in B2C environments, while we tend to use more non-rational elements in our marketing campaigns, for example, using a sexy model to sell an automobile, we still tend to drift back towards those rational elements in our marketing strategies. So in, in point of fact, we don't ask the right questions, but we need to structure ourselves in such a way as we begin to see how can we talk to the conscious and the non-conscious in an individual. Consider this. Just 5% of the brain's activity is focused on conscious thought. The other 95%, that deep iceberg below the surface, is all, all that energy is devoted to non-conscious actions, to instinct, to emotion, to managing this beautiful thing called the body. Um, so very little is actually dedicated to do things like speaking right now. There are, to my way of thinking, three complete brains within an individual. Now, I'm not talking about the reptilian, mammalian, and 
human brains. So this, this is a structure by neuroscientists about how the brain evolved, which thought that the reptilian brain developed first, and then the mammalian brain on top of that, and then the human brain. It's actually a, a notion that's fallen out of favor with most, most neuroscientists today, because um, actually the brain is a lot more complicated than that. We don't have very distinct functional areas. It's much more diffuse. Now I'm talking about the rational in us, the emotional in us, and the instinctual in us. Like when I, I love shopping at Banana Republic. I love it. I love the, the look and feel of the stores. I walk into the store. It really appeals to the emotional side of me, my, my, the, the aesthetic in me. I love, uh, I then go in and I, I'll pull on a pair of pants. These pair of pants, these are from Banana Republic. This t-shirt from Banana Republic. You know, I'll go into the, uh, to the changing room. I'll try on the pants. Damn, Steve, you look fine in those pants. <laughs> right? And, um, and, and, but that's an, an instinctual desire, an instinctual argument to, to want to look good for my wife, right? And then, you know, the rational brain kicks in and I take a look at the price tag and I'm like, shit, I bought so much today, can I actually afford this, right? And so I used to think that that was the way that to construct marketing campaigns, to talk to the rational, the emotional, and instinctual in each of us. But what I've come to understand is that the non-conscious in us holds tremendous sway over the brands we love and the products that we're going to buy. Now, I bet you need some proof. I did, so I brought some along. So, consider, consider this. Would you buy music based on the music you're listening to? Well, excuse me, would you buy wine based on the music you're listening to? How many of you just thought no? Raise your hands. So that's the question that Antonio Rangel, who was a neuroeconomist, asked and answered. So I have some mood music for this slide. Possible to turn it on at the bottom there? Maybe a mouse over right over there? OK, well, guess not. Oh, there we go. Cool. So. What Rangel did is he selected four French wines and four German wines, and he matched them based on price and dryness, right? He put them on a supermarket shelf in England, and then on alternating days, he played French music and German music. And the results were really fascinating. What he found was, on the days that the German music was playing, 71% of the wine that was purchased was German. On days that the French music was playing, 77% of the wine that was purchased was French. Now, does that make any sense? Right? Does that make any sense? No, but clearly the non-conscious had a tremendous impact over what, this indi what these individuals were willing to buy. Need more proof? Well, I'm not wearing any ladies' undergarments right now, um, but I can sure influence how to buy them. So Wrangell took 250 subjects, and he took I, four identical pairs of stockings. I mean, absolutely identical on sheen, on weight, on texture, on feel, everything. What he did differently is each one was scented slightly differently, OK? Now, remember, these are four identical pairs of stockings. Now, the individuals were asked to rate the superior stocking. Every single one rated the superior stocking on factors like sheen, weight, texture, feel. But not one of them said, oh, well, this one smells better than the other one. Okay? But it was clearly scent that was driving which um, stocking they felt was the most um, impactful, the most superior stocking. So another, it's an, an, another, you know, bullet point, another uh, piece of evidence that tells us just how powerful the non-conscious is in our purchase decisions. So think about your lives for a moment. Which memories in your life are, do you remember most vividly? Those that are emotionally laden, either with joy or sadness, or those that are based on rationality and logic? Which ones? Emotion, right? Okay. The brain processes experience and emotional cues and, and non-conscious instinct, and it takes all that and it builds it into a brand perception. 
And as marketers, it's incumbent upon us to influence those brand perceptions. And you're thinking to yourself, gee, can I really do that? Well, if you can build repetitive, positive experiences around a brand, yes, you can switch somebody from Coke to Pepsi. And it's things like, well, think about it this way. Anybody sail here? So competitive sailors, they, are, they swipe seaweed off the hull as they're racing. And you're like, what the hell are you doing? It's a piece of seaweed. Well, every little bit helps. They do it to increase the speed of the boat. Now, you wouldn't think it does anything, but every little bit helps. The same is true in marketing and the experiences that we deliver to our consumers. The quality of that online support experience, the, um, the, the great solution that you find in an online community, the intuitive interface that you find um, on their website or mobile application, they all add up. And if you build enough of these experiences up, you can influence purchase decision in a non-conscious way. Excuse me. So it's neurodigital marketing that actually allows us to do this. Neurodigital marketing is the act of taking digital marketing techniques, whether it is social media, gamification, search, content, and influencing purchase decisions in a, in a non conscious capacity. So let's take a look at what that seems like in action. Could you roll the video, please? Make it louder. So, so those are the girls, Sydney, Molly, and Giselle, and two of my older ones, Emily and Ryan, and my, my wife, and the guy cackling in the back is me. And um, what, what emotions did you just see? Happiness. Happiness. What else? Anything else? Exasperation. Exasperation. Okay, like, are we, are we done? Yes, there was that too. Pride. Pride, yep. So look. Um, happiness was, was definitely one of the preeminent emotions that were out there, and it was all of those actually. We are designed to be happy. In fact, we're, des we're hardwired for it. We're designed to seek out happiness and actively avoid those things which make us uncomfortable or unhappy. Um, and, and as humans, we've been remarkably successful in building a world that delivers to us, in a word, pleasure, right? So there are, and we're, like I said, we're hardwired to do this. Endorphins, ever hear of a runner's high? Right? Endorphins are, are morphine-like chemicals that make us like something. But dopamine is a chemical in our brain that makes us want something. Right? So it, together, these two things are called the, uh, the pleasure mechanism, or what I like to call the happiness machine. If you can engage this happiness machine with digital tactics, your digital tactics will far outstrip those campaigns or those tactics that don't engage this pleasure mechanism. So somebody just handed me this note up from the audience. They're like, Dear Steve, so this all sounds great in theory, but how do I actually get these emotional and instinctual brains engaged? How do I speak to them? Sign emotionally numb. Well, first of all, I'm sorry you're emotionally numb, but um, let me show you how to do that. So gamification is one of the tools that you can use to stimulate the happiness machine. It's meant to um, 
drive um, gamification is the act of using game mechanics in non-game settings, right? And if you think about gaming, gaming is all about getting to the next level. It's about, if you think about the um, popular video games and popular games that are out there, the ones that have gone viral, they have an incredible series of monotonous and repetitive tasks, right? You keep going over and over again to get to that next level. That's the dopamine talking. That's the dopamine saying, um, let's get to that next level. Let's strive to reach that next level. The, this striving behavior is part and parcel. It's actually core to who we are as human beings. You know, Spocks we are not. We are slaves to our pleasure-seeking selves. Okay? My wife is a Sudoku addict, and I use the term Attic. She has it, a compulsion, an addiction. She strives. She wants to do, do it, right? But it's not just the joy of winning, uh, of solving a puzzle. Not just the pleasure, right, that she gets from the endorphins when she solves a puzzle. It's the surprise that she gets at the end of the puzzle when she's delivered a new puzzle. You know, clock Sudoku, a regular Sudoku, 4x4, four 6x6s, four, six 12x12s. Twelve twelve. I mean, I can't keep up with it. I mean, she plays it all the time, uh, you know, on the subway, in meetings, in between meetings. You know, you know I should have gotten a, you know, a shirt for her, you know, spare moment, play Sudoku. But that's, what, that's, what she, that's why she is so addicted to it. But any successful gamification strategy, any successful addiction like hers to Sudoku depends on those two things, that you're intrinsically rewarded with what you're doing and that you are striving, something's pushing you to get to the next level. You have a desire or a path to get to the next level. So. I bet you a lot of you are thinking, well, I bet you this isn't going to work in my market. I mean, it sounds too complicated and stuff like that. So let's take a look at a dull market, the enterprise software market, and specifically let's talk about SAP and its SAP community network. You know, the network was launched about 12 years ago. And the purpose of the network was to provide customers and partners, influencers, with a way to um, get answers to their questions, whether it's a vexing production problem or whether it was an implementation issue. This was the go-to place to get those answers. And what was brilliant about it is that what SAP saw when they launched this community was they saw a dramatic decrease in their support costs. The reason why they saw a dramatic decrease in their support costs is because folks would rather go here and talk to peers rather than pick up a phone call or try the tradition mechan traditional mechanisms of engaging them, um, uh, engaging SAP to get an answer to your question. So as I said, about 12 years ago it was launched. And the, the environment, the community has about 2 million unique visitors per month. And they've clearly reached their limits in terms of organic growth. And so what they did in 2000, and, and by the way, the technology that it was launched on, not very social. You know, it was done about 12 years ago. You know, there wasn't real strong capabilities around comments or ratings and reviews or ability to issue likes and, and, and or the, more of the basic social elements that you would expect. So in 2012, SAP migrated to the Jive platform and all of a sudden they had a lot more social capabilities, but they started freaking out because they all of a sudden they started experiencing what I call engagement entropy. You know, folks were uh, not willing to engage in the community. As a matter of fact, engagement was going down the toilet. And these guys were freaking out because they thought they were going to have to remarket to and re-engage their, uh, their community members. And that's a, I don't know if you've ever been down that path before, but it's a really expensive proposition right, to do that type of re-engagement. So what they decided to do was to gamify the SCN experience. So what they did is they created those multi-level rewards, those multi-level missions that I was mentioning earlier, a series of things to strive towards in the same way that my wife was striving to the next level of Sudoku. They, um, they set those up and gave those out to the community. Right? Ben Franklin said it takes many good deeds to build a good reputation and only one bad deed to lose it. 
the core of the S SAP community is its reputation engine. These missions were designed to earn reputation points. Onboarding a consumer, uh, onboarding a new, a new user, um, creating new content, showcasing expertise, influencing a peer. All of these missions were meant to drive reputation points. The higher the reputation, the more points you, the more missions you, you completed, the more points you gained, the more points that you gained, uh, the higher your reputation within this vast high-tech community. So what's interesting is that uh, the SAP team launched about 30 missions. Each of them, as I mentioned, unsuspecting as to what it was or how you could earn it until you had actually finished the level before. And what was fascinating was the, uh, this number in the upper right hand corner, this 2,210% increase in activity generating reputation points as a result of the gamification. So clearly the gamification had a huge impact on community engagement. Right? And so now SCN has what I would call engagement addicts. Right? And I use the term addiction in the most positive sense because they've got, they've got millions of members who are literally addicted to the site based on that pleasure mechanism that we talked about earlier. Um, and hey, you know what? If you want to be addicted to SCN, go right ahead. It's not for me, but for these guys, it, it serves its purpose. It grew the community. So there are a lot of common mechanics for success in gamification, and these are, are some of them. But the three that I would really you know, leave you with, by the way, you know, dopamine, that neurochemical I was talking about, is um, when there's not enough of it, you, have, you get Parkinson's disease. And it's, treatment is this drug called L-DOPA, which is basically a chemical that's needed to create dopamine in the brain. So when they use L-DOPA to treat people with Parkinson's disease, one of the unfortunate side effects is uh, compulsive gambling. So there's that notion of compulsion and striving behavior again that um, uh, it, it's a medical testament to just how powerful dopamine can be in driving these striving behaviors, these, desire, these compulsions, these addictions. Right? So there, there are three basic mechanics really that I'd leave you with around here. Number one, you have to deliver multiple achievement level missions uh, that are unknown until achieved. Number two, in other words, number two, you have to surprise them with them. And number three, you have to design a program that they both like. It's, it, 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 it appeals to them intrinsically, as well as that they want. They want to get engaged. You want to get them in this loop of wanting to get more and more and more, just like somebody does in a viral game. So it's clear that gamification is one of the tools in neurodigital marketing that you can use to um, evoke the pleasure center and um, drive somebody to really be a fan of your brand or your service. Um, but there are many other emotions, lust, passion, desire, fear, anger, dominance, all of these can be properly engaged through the use of digital tactics um, to have somebody um, love your, uh, your brand and buy your product or service. You have to be able to speak to each of those three brains in order to be a successful digital marketer. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, I have like about a million questions. Okay, we'll start um, with one and we can work our way down. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Um, so what businesses um, do you think are missing the boat with neurodigital marketing? Businesses where there's low hanging fruit. So businesses that provide safety and security. I wouldn't say they're missing the boat, but those are the ones where this type of uh, marketing strategy appeals the right. most. Right? The notion of safety is a very fundamental, um, elemental notion that all humans want. They all, we all want to be safe. We all want to be secure. And so being able to utilize that type of approach is critical. Now to answer your question, 
Um, I think tech, not high tech actually, where I come from, I, I, think we, I think we miss the boat all the time. We think, oh wow, it's a really abstract concept. I'm selling software. How could I possibly engage somebody um, you know, in a neurological level? Well, SAP did it. You yeah. know? But most, most high tech firms don't. Yeah, it's, um, okay, uh, another question then is um, what, uh, what, what, who in the team, in the marketing team, um, can inject this yep. uh, into the efforts of the team? So it should be a collaboration between a digital marketer, the person who's doing you know, ethnographic research or customer research and really kind of trying to paint a picture of who the customer is. And you know, f frankly, your, your, your VP of marketing or CMO should be thinking about you know, campaign strategies. Unless you have a campaign strategist dedicated to uh -huh. that, to me, that, it's that triumvirate, uh, that, those three folks, the campaign strategist or CMO, the digital marketer, and the researcher that should be developing these strategies.